Have you ever wondered how things have gotten to this point? A headline in this week's Salt Lake Tribune, headline, Cockroaches, Zombies, and Dog Poop are More Popular Than Congress. <laughs> the article then goes on to tell us that mothers-in-law, witches, and public radio fun drives also placed ahead of the Congress <laughs> rankings. I, th I think we're kind of at a low point. <laughs> Another headline, this one from the New York Times. Gangplank to a warm future. This was written by a guy who used to design and develop fracking techniques who has now come to realize the errors and dangerous claims made by that industry. The headline nails what many of us feel, that we're walking a gangplank as in the old days when pirates ruled the seas and you knew a nasty fate awaited you when you would run out of wood on the gangplank marching blindfolded towards the open seas. The gangplank metaphor signals a feeling of hopelessness. I understand hopelessness to mean a profound loss of confidence in the future. Hopelessness understood as a profound loss of confidence in the future. There's not much hope of a future at the end of a gangplank. And we somehow are on it, walking blindly into a future, continuing with relentless energy consumption, shredding whatever is left of a safety net for the poor, involved in wars around the world. Compassion grows thin while distrust among disparate cultures rises and, and intensifies to the point that brings on kind of a paralyzing fear. In thinking about the future, how much hope really fills our souls? It's tough to be honest, because we, we want to have hope. Of course we want to have hope. We're liberals. Of course we want to have hope. But how strong is our confidence about where we're headed? Can this doubt, ambivalence, make us less inclined to, to fight for change? I mean, why bother? Last summer, my time at the University of Utah's Environmental Educational Center in Montana overlapped some with Terry Tempest Williams. Now let me tell you, it's always interesting with Terry around. One night at supper on the porch overlooking a huge expanse of the wildlife refuge, when a group of us were conversing about nothing in particular, Terry stopped the chit-chat in its tracks by saying, Tom, do you have hope? That's more of a personal kind of question than you can imagine. <laughs> I was afraid to admit that I had, well, I had my moments of doubt. Couldn't quite admit it. I mean, what would that say about me? I tried to deflect the question by saying, Terry, it's my job to have hope. I get paid to have hope. <laughs> this is what Terry does when she doesn't like a response. <laughs> I looked down kind of sheepishly, looked up again, and our eyes met. She was still waiting. <laughs> I finally told her that, was, that what was important was that we never give up. We have to keep on going, keep on going regardless. And she said an interesting thing. She said, maybe 
Maybe hope isn't that important. What is important is that our lives have integrity. Very few people want to live their lives as though there is no hope, even if they don't necessarily feel the hope. Joanna Macy, in her book called Active Hope, states as her premise that we all have visions of a better, healthier, and saner future. There is, in fact, she says, is this not true? There is, in all of us, a world we long for. The world we long for must become our journey. We need to own that journey towards the world we long for. A lot of hope, a little hope, whatever. Fundamentally, don't we have visions of a better world? Well then, it's your journey, my journey. We must walk that journey with integrity. Joanna Macy reminds us that hope is not a thing that you either have or don't have. Hope is something we do. We have choices. If we lean towards what she calls passive hope, we are merely waiting for external agencies to bring about what we desire. Well, how many of us are really stuck at that level? We just idle along, we think, oh, you know, things will get better. But there's also active hope, whereby we become a participant in bringing about what we hope for, we engage. I recently came upon an essay by our outgoing president of Star King School, our Unitarian Seminary in Berkeley. Rebecca Parker mentioned briefly in passing how James Baldwin ends his book, The Fire Next Time, ends it with just this great inspiration. Well, I haven't read Fire Next Time since college, and so I thought I'd take another look. I still had it on my shelf. And when I pulled it off the shelf, I was startled. It said, 50 cents. <laughs> Baldwin, Baldwin writes about what we need to bring to the table. That is, we need to bring a certain perspective to the table, even in the midst of complete despair. He frames this all with a very simple question. After thoroughly discussing the despair, the depth of loss and grief contained in the African American community in Harlem, where he lived, Drawing on his own experiences about how the culture of self-loathing grows fast and furious in such a depressive environment. That black parents must communicate to their children that a black presence, their black presence, is not welcome in society. And that everything seems so fractured. Relationships, trust, indeed life itself. Baldwin then invokes the rhythms of jazz, the resilience of spirit, the freshness of new life embodied in the children growing up in the community. And he finally asks, what do we do with all this beauty? What does life's beauty ask of us? It was only quite recently, in fact it was at an environmental ministry workshop that I, that I saw an actual photo of what the land looks like after it has been fracked. And there was a photo of the fracking going on in Alberta, Canada. It was horrifically ugly. 
about as ugly as it gets. As ugly as 1,100 garment workers in Bangladesh dying in a fire as the exit doors were locked shut. Ugly like the Arab Spring gone to murder and mayhem. Ugly like the cold-blooded shooting of Trayvon Martin. Ugly like the unconscionable rise of poverty among children in our country. What do we do with all this beauty? The times we live in demand something of us. The times cry out for change and transformation. A great writer on the subject of hope, Ernest Bloch, who as a Jew experienced the hell of Hitler's Germany, fled to the States in 1938. Ernest Bloch wrote in his masterpiece, The Principles of Hope that in the darkness of the lived moment, humanity stands between redemption and, and destruction. In these dark times, we stand between redemption and destruction. Both are possible, he adds. Well, we <laughs> witness and experience the darkness of a world gone mad with cruelty. Innocent people are slaughtered or die of starvation. The rainforest, the oceans, the wilderness, the soil, the streams, the air, all being decimated, contaminated, and lost forever. We grow disheartened, but is it still in us to ask what shall we do with all this beauty? And faced with both redemption and destruction, is it still in us to opt for that which will save the world and save ourselves? And as we acknowledge that hope struggles in a dark world, we must also acknowledge that much is left to us you know, unless we have zero confidence in the future, our active hope, our doing, our engagement remains paramount. 